Hello, I'm Mark. Uh, I'm maintainer of the Linux CAN uh, subsystem, and Alexei is with me. He is uh, doing the J1939 stuff. And to bring you all uh, on the same page, uh, what is CAN? Yeah, yesterday evening. I, just, I copied them at like 1 a.m. Maybe? No. <laughs> let, me, let me look. Okay. Maybe Onyx say you can. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay, here I'm taking over until the new version, which will be downloaded. Um, I am Oleksiy Rempel. Uh, I'm maintaining the G1939 stack. Uh, it is. Uh, can based stack uh, and used usually in uh, heavy duty vehicles, uh, uh, tractors or uh, boats, marine and so on. Um, it was designed uh, to uh, combine, uh, to allow different vendors to produce uh, uh, components which are compatible with each other. So people like, uh, you know, uh, you can, if you have a tractor, you can buy a terminal and uh, some extra additional stuff plug it uh, and it should just work. Uh, to allow this uh, capability, uh, there are different uh, paths uh, defined. Uh, first of all, um, it, uh, there is a transport part, like uh, some, somehow like TCP, so you can uh, transfer uh, longer, more data, longer transfers, uh, because uh, usual constraints in CAN, you can max uh, the payload. Payload is uh, only eight bytes, uh, and to combine everything uh, to something uh, longer, uh, you need extra protocol, and uh, J1939 is doing this. So you are able to transfer up to like 120 megabytes. Um, Second part, which is uh, addressed by this protocol, is uh, address claiming. It is somehow similar to DHCP and uh, kind of DNS combination. Uh, so uh, different components uh, are able to get or to announce own address on the bus uh, without making conflict. So addresses are not just taken, they are communicating with each other and saying like, I'm taking, taking address eight and the other one, oh, I'm here on A2. And uh, based on uh, naming, uh, there will be some kind of uh, um, update like, oh, my name is uh, cooler or better. So my address is uh, staying on this place. Can't make it here anything. Oh, was it that today? Yeah. Okay, what's my because I uploaded the new slide, so you got to always put it on now. Ah, here's the my new version. Okay. I'm skipping Mark's part and going back to <laughs> my <laughs> Yeah. And uh, the protocol provides uh, even high level specifications, some uh, think like uh, file uh, server uh, is defined by ISOBUS, which is uh, high level specification on top of uh, J1939. Uh, for example, you can uh, implement something like uh, FTP server or e HTTP server. So uh, terminals are usually uh, called virtual terminal. Uh, they uh, will download uh, some information from um, your uh, extra components which attached on uh, the bus and you will get uh, already uh, some view of the system and uh, some buttons and so on. Uh, as maintainer, uh, I usually care about, well, maintaining, extending framework, making it uh, stable and uh, fixing SUS board reports and so on, uh, but it's uh, not matter how good the coder is, if there is no infrastructure it's not really interesting. Uh, so I was uh, knocking to different doors and asking to show me some, something if it's used. And uh, here's one example. Uh, I was not allowed to show end product, uh, which is using this kernel stack, but this is a, a 
step till the end product, which is green board, which is actually using uh, kernel stack. And uh, as you can see, it is showing uh, functionality of the components like this one. Um, and it is uh, made by this virtual terminal, which is transferring all the data, showing the structure and so on. So uh, this information is not part of the virtual terminal, actually, but uh, of the uh, component provided by this. Um, sadly, uh, this uh, virtual terminal implementation is not uh, main, uh, open source. Um, yeah, and I have seen there are some uh, fun projects. Um, one of uh, developers uh, notified us uh, on uh, Ken Utils. Um, this is uh, just some existing uh, heavy to the cluster, uh, which is attached to the uh, game Eurotrack Simulator 2, and uh, it is using uh, Linux kernel J39 uh, stack, which is just working in this case. Uh, there are some other uh, applications. Uh, some of them uh, was uh, made earlier. Uh, some of them uh, I created just uh, last year. Um, as you can see, there is uh, a trace claiming daemon. It is kind of a DHCP um, variant uh, for J939. Um, it, it can be used in production as well. Uh, usually you just need to start it and uh, say what addresses would you like to claim and what is the name of your application. Um, then there's uh, J1939 cat. It is not really usable for, uh, for end product, but it is good for testing. You can just uh, take uh, uh, this uh, application and get some data as input and uh, send it over can and receive it with uh, same application on the other side. So you can just transfer your that, uh, files or whatever, um, it works. Um, the spy, well, it's just a kind of monitor which is only showing you the frames. Then SR, simple send read application. And the Isobus FS, uh, this is the application I uh, made uh, this year. Um, it is uh, kind of file server, and uh, in this case it is both server and client. So both parts are implemented, and if you like it, you can use it. I licensed it as uh, LGPL, so you can link it in your application if you like or work it like this. It is a command line, uh, it has command line interface on the uh, client side and just simple server. And uh, I implemented, so uh, time date, uh, it is um, according to the J1939 st standard, which is, again, no, that, this is only, yeah. This is both sides. Uh, you can uh, run a server on one side, uh, which will uh, read, uh, get uh, local system time on one side, and on the other side, you can just ask what is the system time of this uh, uh, remote uh, MCU which is attached on the bus. And uh, currently, I'm working on Virtual position service. Um, there are two types of standard. Uh, one is uh, plain J1939, uh, which is uh, less precise, um, and there is NMEA 2000 <coughs> for um, uh, boards, uh, which provide more information. Both of them uh, are should be supported by um, this application. And so far, I implemented the server part, which is working with uh, GPS D uh, server. You, so you can, if you like, uh, you can just take Raspberry Pi, attach uh, uh, 
GPS receiver, run GPS D server, and uh, start my application. And both of all of this will should theoretically work uh, compatible with uh, any bot or any tractor. Um, so you'll need on other side uh, only some terminal which will show your uh, position and use it as uh, something. <laughs> Uh, I am still planning to do the client part as well, uh, which should um, Is use this application again and uh, inject the data to the GPSD again. Is that working well? Because I have had problems with uh, latency with GPSD. Sorry? So uh, with GPSD, I've had problems with the latency. So if you want, in, in vehicle, you typically want well, depends on what it's used for, but if it's used for like uh, um, yeah, uh, autonomous uh, I, uh, ish things, then the latency has to be low and GPS tends to be problematic then. Well, every frequency is transferred over G uh, CAN is kind of with some latency. Um, yeah, but in the CAN has a, has a uh, guaranteed latency, um, well, GPSD tends to. Currently, I didn't investigate it deeper. It was just like proof of concept, and if you like it, you can test it. <laughs> yeah, um, here's some example how it was working. The top part is the GPSD client, which is showing uh, current position. Um, the second part is just a uh, can dump, which is showing, okay, they are transferring uh, the data over a uh, can with uh, all uh, related positions. And uh, the last one is a client, which is uh, receiving all of these positions. But currently, there was nothing um, which is uh, using for some usable application. So uh, I'm trying hard to uh, get as much attention as possible for this stack because, uh, well, the uh, customer for who this stack was needed uh, is using it, it's happy, and uh, it works, and so on. But uh, I have no time, real time, to extend it, and uh, I'm trying to present it to other uh, customers, but uh, currently with no luck. Uh, so yeah. Uh, everyone is welcome. Uh, I'm trying to provide as much tools as possible and uh, get some uh, testing uh, against uh, uh, applications uh, or validation applications which are available at least uh, by uh, the customer who is uh, needing this uh, stack. Um, at least Isobus file server was validated and the stack kernel stack was validated as well. Um, and it was validated not only by uh, these tools. Uh, I had uh, some feedback from uh, Huawei, which are, I don't know why, but they seem to have some interest and provided some feedback, like uh, some things was not uh, according to the specifications and so on. Um, yeah. I wanted to have at least five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> So going back to the beginning, um, yeah, um, you all have now heard about CAN. Um, the basics, it's a uh, protocol from the 80s. It's just eight bytes uh, in the original version, 64 bytes um, in the what is currently um, deployed. Uh, there's no flow control, and um, this is in to together all uh, a problem. On, on most controllers. Uh, usually the IP core receives a packet, generates IRQ, then the kernel runs the IRQ handler and um, what you should do, at least what the network guys say, um, you mask the uh, IRQ and then you schedule an API, an API which runs in soft IRQ context or as a kernel thread does the rest of the work um, for CAN because they, most controllers don't support DMA. You allocate your SKB, copy the data from the controller, and push everything into the networking stack. And in NAPI, you use the function net if receive SKB for this, and everything is fine. But 
we don't have DMA, and so the IP cores have to store the incoming packets in their internal buffers, and these are, if it's good, if it's a good controller, 32 by 32 frames, but um, on a typical CAN bus, you can have a really high number of CAN frames, and this makes up to 10,000 IRQs or frames per second, and then you can do the calculation, you can do the math yourself, how many uh, interrupts uh, you have until you are uh, 32 frames of buffer is full, and uh, then you, on small systems or loaded systems, or even on loaded small systems, the latency between the interrupt and when the NAPI runs is most of the times, if it's a really busy system, too high, and then you get packet loss. This is not good. And because there's no flow control, can most upper layer protocols rely on that the packets are received? And yeah, how to avoid this? Uh, should we do as we did in the good old days before we had NAPI? Basically, do the work in the IRQ handler, but you cannot use the function that is used in NAPI. You have to use netefrx. Ask the network guys why this is a different function, probably because of locking and whatever. The downside is uh, this function works from IRQ, the other not. But the downside is this function is uh, prone to mess up the order of the incoming packets. Because we have no flow control in CAN, this is an absolute nightmare uh, for all protocols. So we have to do something in between. And this is where Eric's offload comes in. It's a helper. Um, the interrupt handler comes, and then you copy your data from the IP core, push it into a queue, either by timestamp or you just append it to the queue. And then you say, Eric's offload, yeah, I'm finished with my IRQ handler. Well, you need a different function if it's a threaded IRQ. And then you kick on the NAPI. And the NAPI iterates over this queue that we have in software and uses the correct function, the net IF receive SKB, so that the networking stack is happy and all the packets come into the stack in the right order. And the CAN guys are happy that uh, they receive, even under heavy loads, all the CAN frames. Um, even on, on systems with many cores, we have seen this problem. So um, networking drivers, CAN networking drivers really should implement this and not do NAPI uh, because the latency might be too high. And then I want to just uh, mention timestamping. Uh, timestamping is very nice to have in CAN, and um, you usually have a different free running timer in your uh, IP core, and you somehow have to express this in the kernel representation, which is nanoseconds, and you have to do the calculation from the internal timer to the kernel stuff. And um, the clock guys have implemented these uh, helpers. This is a cycle counter and time counter framework. Uh, you have to fill out this struct uh, read function. You have to say uh, how many bits of information are valid on your timestamp. And you say multiply the timestamp by this and shift it by that. Then you get nanoseconds. Uh, please implement this if you want to do timestamping. Don't invent everything on your own. It's already in the kernel. And this also takes care with another helper of calculating the internal timestamp to the kernel version and the other way around if you need to. And you can set up a worker um, that takes care of uh, overflows in your free running timer. Um, this might be even interesting uh, for your um, wideband stuff. If you have a free running timer in there, um, you can use this cycle counter, time counter to calculate, uh, to convert it in, into nanoseconds. Yeah. Got a question, real quick? Question. We probably good. only have time for one or two questions. Yeah. Yeah. 
<laughs> um, do you need some kind of drift compensation because the the Sorry? do you need some kind of drift compensation because the can clock is probably not going to have the same source clock source as the kernel clock? Uh, you. I had something. I, I attached the can internal clock to um, PTP so that you can run the functions to uh, have, have a control loop to um, match one clock to the other so that they don't drift apart. Yeah. But it haven't used it in production. But you can have hardware timestamps and. Yeah, they tend to drift because they are not perfectly synchronous, but you can, I, I have attached uh, PTP stuff to it, so at least you can locally track both clocks if you want to. Cut it off there. So, was one question? So, any more questions? Otherwise, uh, take it in the hallway maybe, and yeah. we need to move to the next. Sorry about the. Yeah, no presentation problem. mix up. Yeah. More time, more time for Alexei with the yeah.